The teaching is based on Psalm 84, and you can find Psalm 84 reproduced for you in the worship guide. It's under the commitment section, and as I read it, I would encourage you to give yourself to God anew by listening to his word. Psalm 84, to the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is God's word. Well, for those of you who don't know, I just got back from vacation last Sunday. We vacation in Tawas. Tawas is here on the Michigan map for you to know. We've been going there for almost 20 years. We enjoy our time immensely. It's a happy place for us, a very happy place. The time by the lake and the fun with the grandkids and the ice cream every night. And that's every night. That is no exaggeration. Royal New York Cheesecake Blizzard from Dairy Queen. Every night. And we go there in order to relax and to refresh. And as I talk about vacation spots, you might right now be thinking about a vacation spot, a happy place that you like to go to, that you look forward to going to, that you retreat to in rough times perhaps, or maybe just go there to clear your head. Happy places are what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 84. The psalm writer has his place that makes him happy and he writes this poem to show us that it is the happiest of places because it is the presence of the Lord. In fact, he highlights this happiness throughout the psalm with the word blessed. The word blessed appears at least three times in the psalm and it kind of divides the psalm for us. You see it in verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. And then you see it again in verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. And then you see it again at the end of the psalm, verse 12. O oh Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. The word blessed is a cheerful exclamation that the psalmist is making. And we don't have a picture of his face as he says it, but I imagine it's similar to the face of my granddaughter when my daughter and my son-in-law handed her the ice cream cone during vacation. There was a look of exclamation, of joy on her face. This is the best way to live, I'm sure Gwen was thinking at the time she was eating her ice cream. This is the best way to live, is what the psalmist is saying. I know there will be sadness, and so happy is kind of a rough translation. We have to be careful with it when we think of it um, uh, compared to blessing. But blessing means here is the one who enjoys the favor of God. And so this psalm is inviting us in today to enjoy his favor once again. And how do we do that? Well, we do it the way the psalmist does. We just go through his words 
And the Spirit of God is good to work in our hearts. What can we expect to find in the psalm today? Number one, we can expect to find God lovely. Number two, there is joy in the journey. And number three, God will satisfy your heart as you trust in Him. So, number one, God is lovely. And so the psalmist longs for Him. I think the strongest expression of his longing is here at the start of the psalm. If you look at verse 1, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. And keep something in mind here in verse 1. He's not so much speaking about the beauty of the temple. He's not so much thinking about the architecture of where God's presence is revealed. No, he's actually speaking more of his intense love that he feels when he thinks about the presence of God. It's not so much a statement of how beautiful is the temple of God as much as it is a statement of how much I love it. How much I long for it. How much I want to be in God's presence. When he considers God's presence, he thinks about the longing for it that grows in his heart and is growing in his heart. Look at verse 2. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. He talks about his soul. He talks about his heart. He talks about his flesh. That's a Hebrew way of talking about every part of him. Holistically, he longs for the Lord. His whole being cries out to be in God's presence. He swoons when he thinks about being in God's presence. He sings when he thinks about being in God's presence. He thinks, God, I cannot think of any place I'd rather be than in your presence. And at the beginning of the psalm, we start to understand how the psalmist's heart is likely more in tune than your heart today and my heart. I mean, after all, I saw some of the greeters at the door today, and not a one of them said, oh, when people came in, man, they were fainting. They were swooning. They were singing. Nobody came in like that. Yesterday, I went to a wedding, and as I watched the couple make their vows and look into each other's eyes, it was clear to me that they could not think of any other place they'd rather be because they were finding in each other a treasure. So the question becomes, what if we don't sense God to be the greatest treasure in our hearts right now? Well, again, the psalmist has the answer for that. Look at verses 3 and 4. He's thinking of sparrows and he's thinking of altars. And he's telling us with these verses that if we think of sparrows and altars, then that longing for God's presence will increase in us too. So verses 3 and 4, even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Why is he longing to be with God? Because he knows what God is like. And that is what makes him want to be with God. He's thought about the sparrows that he has seen in the house of God. The house of God he's talking about maybe the tabernacle, it could be the temple. The point is that it's open to the air and the birds have just found nests in the bricks or maybe in the the laps between the tent. These, These sparrows have found a home there is what he's saying. Sparrows in the Bible are a metaphor for what is insignificant and what is weak, what is vulnerable, what is frail. And the psalmist doubles down on the insignificance of these creatures by talking about not only have the sparrows found a home there, but they're young. Those who are even less significant, those who are even weaker, 
have found a home in the Lord's house. If you come in the front doors of Bethesda and you look up at the columns from time to time, you will see birds' nests and you will see the birds nesting there in the columns. I can't stand it, to be honest with you. (laughs) But it is a nice reminder of how even the birds are allowed to make a home in God's presence, to be tucked in, to find a home The psalmist uses this imagery to say that God has welcomed them. This is a beautiful thought of the sparrow and her young because it shows us the gentle nature of our God. And we long to be in his presence all the more when we grasp the truth that we are like those birds We are frail and vulnerable, and yet there is a welcome for us in the presence of God. How is that possible that the living, almighty God would welcome people weak and deserving of death? Well, that's the second word that he emphasizes here, the altar. Now, if you're reading through the psalm at first, it might be confusing. Why would birds feel comfortable next to an altar where they could easily be sacrificed. And that's not his point. Instead, his point is to show us how we can live in the presence of God, and that's through an altar. The altar speaks of sacrifice. And the altar reminded the people of God that it was only through sacrifice, it was only through God making a sacrifice or they making a sacrifice to God that would satisfy his wrath and experience his joy and allow them into his presence in the first place. As, as this psalmist is thinking about the altar, no doubt he's got in his mind this altar, which, by the way, is in no way beautiful with its stained um, edifice with blood. It's a bloody place. But as he thinks about it, it becomes beautiful to him because it's the way that God allows him into his presence. We, of course, in New Testament times don't think that way anymore. As as Ken mentioned, there's no more sacrifice for sin. That has been made by Jesus Christ. And so now we look to Christ as our perfect sacrifice, the one who was willing to hang bloody on a tree for you and me. So by faith in him, we can not only experience God's presence, but we can long for his presence. I mean, think about it. What are all the things you longed for this week? How worthless were so many of them? How many of them disappointed you? God doesn't disappoint. Again, I find it helpful at times to to use the prayers of people who have thought very carefully through these psalms. Let me read one of these prayers for you. This appears in Tim Keller's book on the psalms. And this is what Tim Keller prays at the end of this section of Psalm 84. Lord, my fellowship with you comes and goes. My nearness to you waxes and wanes. But today I resolve to live my whole life near you, to build my home near your altar. Show me that, show me what that will entail, and give me enough love and grace to do it. That's a beautiful prayer. I hope you could adopt something like that as your own. Are you thinking enough about the sacrifice of Christ today for you? Are you thinking about that enough on a weekly basis? Probably not. But I can guarantee you this. Christ is thinking of you. If you have faith in him, he is thinking of you with a pleasure that you and I have yet to experience. So, go to God and you will find him lovely like the psalmist did. Number two, There is joy in the journey. Maybe like me, some of you hear that title, There is Joy in the Journey, and you're thinking of that old Michael Card song. There is a joy in the journey. Here's how part of that song goes. There is a joy in the journey. 
There's a light we can love on the way. There is a wonder and wildness to life and freedom for those who obey. That's just part of the song. He says there's a light we can love on the way. What is that light that he's talking about that we can love on the way? That light is the certain hope of someday being in the presence of God. And so in the first section, the psalmist has been thinking about what it's like to be in the presence of God. But in the second section, he knows he's not there yet, and he's thinking about traveling to God's presence. Of course, in an Old Testament psalm, the psalm writer would be thinking about pilgrims who are traveling to Jerusalem or to Mount Zion to experience God's presence in the temple. I think just to quickly get ahead of this, in the New Testament, as we think about being in the presence of God, we should certainly keep in mind that journey that we're making to heaven. No Christian is aimless in the, in the Christian life if he or she is aiming toward heaven. It is a gift that has been given to us by God. It is a north star for us to focus on. It is something that should grab our attention. And once again, it may not grab our attention. Why not? Because we're weak and sinners. But the psalmist again helps us. In verses 5 6 and 7, the psalmist talks about this, this journey. And the thought of God is what enables him to keep going. Verse 5, blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. No commentator knows where the Valley of Baca is, but every commentator agrees that the, the Valley of Baca is a dry place. It would be a difficult journey for pilgrims to get to Mount Zion. There would be dry times. There would be difficulty. There would be hardship. These are words that just simply describe our own journey to heaven. There are dry times. There are difficulties. There is hardship. And, and yet, as they go on in this journey, it is the thought of God's presence which gives them strength. Again, look at uh, verse 7. They go from strength to strength on this difficult journey because their hope is set on God. God brings refreshment to them as they, as they travel Look at, look at verse 6. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. So there are times of refreshment. You probably know what the psalmist felt like when you are thinking about the next vacation you're going on. And some of it, for some of you, it might be tomorrow. And others next week. But you know, you know what happens in your, in your mind? You start to kind of wind down and you think about where we're going and what we're going to do and who we're going to be with and it starts to bring you joy. It kind of brings a light, light-heartedness to your life as you think about that. that that's what's going on in the, in the mind of the psalmist. He, he, he's, he's feeling uh, a refreshment as he travels to God even though it's difficult. The Shawshank Redemption, man, it's an old movie. It uh, talks about the life of Andy Dufresne. Andy wound up in jail, in prison for life. And the movie depicts all of the hardships and difficulties that he went through by being in prison. At the end of the movie, we get a flashback and we realize that all the while, Andy has been digging a tunnel out the side of his cell wall and he winds up eventually on a beach in Mexico. And so suddenly his, his life in prison starts to make a little more sense. He's, he's had a lightheartedness almost in prison. It, it's really interesting. You, you watch the movie and it's not till you get to the end that you realize he had a light in mind. 
He had a beach in mind. He had another destination in mind as he was tunneling. And, and he reached it. And, and there's another flashback at the end of the movie where after he's escaped, all of his friends from prison, you can have friends in prison, I guess you can, sat around and they're actually laughing as they think about his antics in prison, his lightheartedness. How could he be like that? They're thinking, well, well now they know. Because all the while, he was going to be escaping. The most joyful Christians to be around are those who have heaven in mind. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. You know that. As you think about rubbing shoulders with people here at church, who are the most joyful ones to be around? Who are the ones who bring a smile to your face and and who really show you something that maybe you've lost sight of. It's those that have heaven in mind. It's those that talk about Christ's presence. Knowing where we're going matters so much to us. And so, as Tim Keller has thought about this section, this is the prayer that he ends with. And again, I hope you can make it your prayer. Lord, I already have enough history with you to see that my driest and poorest times have been my richest. I still dread such periods, and that is right, but help me not to give up in them or forget that you are working out great things. Amen. Well, the third point is that God will satisfy your heart. And you don't have to wait till the end to understand that. I don't know if you picked up on this, but throughout the psalm, the writer has been reinforcing who God is time and time again. He uses phrases like Lord of hosts. So his thoughts are set on a God who is the God of armies who has heavenly messengers who do his bidding for his people. He talks about God as a living God, which would certainly be a a contrast with all the other gods of the day who are dead. He talks about God as a king, one who has authority. It speaks of his sovereignty, his control, even over those driest moments that you and I go through. He talks about him as the God of Jacob, This is probably getting at God as a promise maker and a promise keeper. One of the most precious thoughts that you and I can hold on to in Christianity. He talks about God as the sun. That is, God illuminates our lives for us. Only by looking at him do things make sense. God is a shield. That means he offers protection and care. No wonder the psalmist says toward the end of the psalm, no good thing will he withhold because he has already become these things to the psalmist. It's like a down payment for the psalmist. How have you thought about God this week? I can tell you right now, if you haven't thought like the psalmist presents him, then you're likely to fall into some bad concepts of our God Without the psalmist's help, we can think of God as stingy, uncaring, cold, distant, forcing you to fend for yourself, not really capable or desiring to care for you. That's not God. That's not our God. In fact, the psalmist has contemplated God for so long that he's able to say, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. (laughs) I would rather perform menial tasks in God's presence 
to just be a doorkeeper, to just be an insignificant, vulnerable, frail person in his presence, then I would dwell and feel at home in the ways of wicked people who promise us so much. How do you think of God? The psalmist gives us a beautiful picture. And in closing, rather than close with a prayer by Tim Keller, let me close with the prayer that's in the psalm. Verses 8 and 9. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. What does that mean? The psalmist is praying that God would show favor to the king. Because if the king was acting rightly, then there would be a temple to go to. Then the priests would be serving like they should. Then the people would be established in the land and not be exiled. All of it depends on the king. It's God's favor on the king. That's what's important. Now, we don't pray this prayer quite like they did in this day because as this psalmist is praying it, the, the kings were wicked. Uh, that, that's why he's praying, God, please look on your anointed. Please show them favor. Please write their hearts because without the king's heart being right, we are sunk. We don't have to pray it quite the same way today because... God has looked on his king with favor. Jesus is our king. Jesus died for us, and now he is that living God for us. Our prayer has been answered. So now how do we pray this prayer? When we pray, Lord, look on the face of your anointed, we're saying, God, focus your attention on your son and the delight that you have on him for what he did for sinners like us. And the Father does delight in the Son in that way. And that is the delight that fills our hearts. The faithful Son going before a holy Father, dying for sinners like you and me so that all of these blessings of who God is are now ours in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord of hosts, promise keeper, covenant maker, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would fill our minds with these thoughts for the week and that your spirit would illuminate what they really mean for our hearts and our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.